It's a big step forward. It's the first drug, at least in Europe, that is approved for type 1 diabetes after insulin, after 1922. And so I believe with all the caution that we need, uh, it's, it's a big step forward. SGLT2 inhibitors have been approved for people with type 2 diabetes in many countries and are helping many patients around the world keep blood glucose low. But could these drugs be used for people with type 1 diabetes? To discuss this issue, I'd like to be joined by two experts on the subject, and thank you gentlemen for joining me. Um, and obviously there is a lot of discussion about if these inhibitors can be used for type 1. Why don't we begin with um, some background on the success we're seeing on the SGLT2 inhibitors? Yes, well actually we have uh, three different compounds which have been studied in a broad clinical trial setting and they, in my mind, have shown a great benefit. Uh, they are lowering A1C, they are not increasing hypoglycemia as we usually see when A1C is lowered. They reduce glycemic variability, they reduce uh, elevated blood pressure and they have uh, a weight loss effect uh, as well. So many, uh, it's a whole bag of uh, potential benefits. How long have these been considered for type 1 and what makes you think that this might be an option? I'll ask you. Well, the drugs have been used off-label since they were first approved by the regulatory agencies. So we have lots of case reports of individuals with type 1 diabetes using the drugs. And it's important to understand that historically there have been very few options for people with type 1 diabetes beyond insulin. So having those options really is an unmet need that we need to be exploring. Now, if we talk about the differences between T1 and T2, that must make it challenging. On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. Because what we are currently facing in type 1 as in type 2, that people are dying of a very high cardiovascular mortality. Recent data from the Swedish registry show that if a girl develops diabetes before age 10, she is losing 17 years of her life compared to her peers, and for boys it's 14 years. So it's a, still, although we have you know, really made a lot of improvements, some data show there is still a lot of unmet need in terms of cardiovascular mortality in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So are there some concerns? There are. So the, there's a fundamental difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes in terms of risks of ketosis. And these drugs have an effect on ketone body generation. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a potentially fatal complication of type 1 diabetes. And even in the type 2 population, we were seeing it occurring with these drugs. The risk, and it's a very real one, is that in type 1 diabetes, unless individuals are very cautious and monitor their ketone levels, the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis actually goes up anywhere from 5 to 17 fold with these drugs. So how do you make them safe? Broad question, I know. No, but it's uh, actually a very good question because the whole international consensus came together and actually discussed that. And it is about patient selection. You have to select the right patient for it. Uh, it is about education because what we have been successful in doing is reducing the rate of hypoglycemia in the overall population. What we have not been successful is reducing DKA and this is also an educational issue in the broad population of uh, um, diabetes teams as well as, as patients. So we believe uh, it can be done uh, but we certainly need to do it because it's clearly a risk uh, not only with this type of drugs but in the general type 1 population. Yeah, so if we look at just the progress we're seeing with type 1 patients, how hopeful are we? In, in specific reference to the DKA risk in type 1 diabetes, the type 1 diabetes exchange has data that would suggest that about 5% of individuals with type 1 diabetes develop DKA annually. In the control trials of SGLT2 inhibitors in type 1 diabetes, their interventions were able to drop that rate to about 1%. So the mitigation factors can come into play. The concern is, can we duplicate those mitigation factors in the general population that have been shown to be effective in the controlled clinical trials? You know, and lastly, are we looking in the right direction or are there are other paths we should be also exploring? Well, as I said before, I mean, we still have a 
huge unmet need in type 1 diabetes, but I really think those drugs are a big step forward because what my patients tell me once they take this drug from day one, their glycemic variability is going down. So they immediately see an effect that their glucoses are much more predictable and they have a much better day if they wake up more or less with the same glucose every morning. And so I really believe it's, it's, a, it's a big step forward. It's the first drug, at least in Europe, that is approved for type 1 diabetes after insulin, after 1922. And so I believe with all the caution that we need, uh, it's, a, it's a big step forward. And you agree? I agree to a point. I think that the individuals with type 1 diabetes who choose to use this therapy need to be aware of the risks and need to be aware that as they lower their insulin doses, there's a threshold that they cannot go beyond. Well, I appreciate your wealth of knowledge, both of you gentlemen, and thank you so much and enjoy your time here. Thank you so much. Thank you. ADA TV is brought to you from the American Diabetes Association 79th Scientific Sessions. For more from the meeting, make sure to click these links and subscribe for much more from the world of medicine.